Ghana's controller and accountant general from 2005 to 2009. Currently, a board member of the Internal Audit Agency, Christian Tetesotti, who also was once an assistant commissioner at the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRA, has questions to answer. Yes, he, together with the GRA boss and the finance minister, he left his job as the technical advisor to the Commissioner General in 2019 to manage a company same year with no track record, no experience in revenue assurance in the petroleum industry, sole sourced, hand-picked to do revenue assurance services for governments. Something that was already being done by other third parties. Yes, the government is this company's only customer since the company, SML, was established. SML has a contract for 10 years. 10 years. And is entitled to over $100 million each year. It is a plug-in into the revenue stream of the state, taking money for no job done. Ben Boachie, Executive Director, Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, insists. A mining expert adds that the engagement of SML to monitor gold production is, quote, a typical create loot and share scheme to plunder the resources of the state. Is SML a duplication if it did that job? The state, with the aid of third parties, introduced the ED ERDMS in 2018 by which every liter of petroleum product is accounted for, for tax purposes. It ensures, quote, 100% efficiency and transparency, officials have told the fourth estate. The GRA itself has confirmed or did confirm until last week CEO of the National Petroleum Authority has doubts about the need for SML. In fact, the GRA said it does not rely on what the SML does for its tax purposes. The very reason for its engagement. The OSP is commencing investigations and just yesterday, Parliament also set in motion an investigation and directed suspension of payments to SML. This week started with Catholics and even non-Catholics the world over agitated at news that sought to damage the image of the world's biggest Christian denomination with the largest membership and impact on society. Popular US evangelist, president of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Franklin Graham, joined many in slamming Pope Francis. He wrote, so-called blessings from religious leaders won't save you from the judgment of God. He said, you can't bless what God calls sin. Catholic bishops elsewhere rejected what was reported or misreported as authorization for Catholic priests to bless same-sex marriages. We speak to Catholic bishops over their statements to the contrary. 
But we commence today's discussion or show with our first hour interacting with the education minister about government's management of the sector in the wake of an agenda by the NDC to scrap teacher licensure exams and concerns about standards despite recording the best WASI results. I'm Samson Ladia Nyemini. We'll be right back to deal with the VEX matters. You're welcome back. This is Newsfile, it's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, as always, we put Ghana first. This is a very final edition for 2023. Relax and get to enjoy our show for today. We're inviting all of you, our viewers and listeners today, to take extra time. You always do share a lot of messages with us. But today, we are committing to dedicate time to read and share all your messages. Maybe, just maybe, we may open the phone lines at a certain point in time to allow you time to also uh, participate in the discussions live. Uh, thank you very much. So it's been a year. So what's, what are your thoughts, particularly about the things we are discussing today? But if there are any that you want to share your views on with us, we will welcome them. So get ready and start doing just that. I have the education minister in the studio, Dr. Yao Osei Edichum, the minister for education and MP Bosom Che. So if you have any questions about education, if you have heard of any concerns and critique, share them with us and we will have him respond to them accordingly. Good morning, sir, and thank you very much for making the time to join us here. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. So today, part of it is to see, get him to prove me wrong. <laughs> you know, I did a take about him and spoke about him in certain terms. And those who don't like that truth that I told had a lot of things to say. I said, for example, that he is a great citizen that was flying high, the flag of Ghana home and abroad. And he was doing a lot of marvelous things. He represented leadership that brings transformation. And there is evidence to that that I showed. So this morning is one on one. He should prove me wrong <laughs> so, <laughs> or shame my critics, so to speak. Right. So I'm beginning the show, and you are seeing these uh, images with you in classrooms, in laboratories, hands-on. And people say, this is the example we want. We are aware of what you did with the educational institution you set up in the United States of America producing shining example of leaders over there. What is it about your philosophy in this sector? Thank you. Thank you so much, Samson, for such a wonderful opportunity, for giving me such a huge platform uh, to share what the President of the Republic has empowered me and enabled me to do uh, in Ghana. As you all know, I was in the United States of America and experiencing the American dream a first-generation immigrant opening schools in Los Angeles. 200 workers, um, college prep schools, every student paid for by government, and it was a wonderful opportunity. And the president asked me to come back home and help him change the education system. These were his words when he was campaigning for office and meeting a mentor of mine, asking him, should I go, should I not go? And, and his words was very instructive. He just said, this is the mentor of my uh, Honorable Melvin Diamond, a former congressman. He said, America can do without you, but maybe your country cannot do without you, so go home and help your people. It was almost like he was speaking to me, uh, to my heart, and God was speaking uh, to me through him, and I decided to come. My philosophy, you know, I, I grew up in a very uh, challenging 
fiscal environment. I always say my father was not poor, but he had a cash flow problem as a cocoa farmer. And not being able to get the cash at the right time when it was needed by the family, I shift my whole philosophy of thinking and, and doing, thing in the, doing things in the education space. When I almost missed uh, high school because he couldn't put together 40 cities. Hmm. And it was my younger brother who one evening sitting in the middle of the cocoa farm in a hamlet had an idea and he said, why don't you go to Jachi? Tell that, give you money to take the uh, transport, go to Jachi. I have this pig that my uncles had given to me uh, because I'm helping them on their piggery farm. Maybe if you sell it, you get the opportunity to go to secondary school. My dad was struggling at the time, had taken me from village to village, begging his friends, can you lend me 40 Nobody could do that. It wasn't cocoa season yet. Came back to Yachi, we sold the pig. We took it around, we sold, uh, we, we actually uh, uh, did a retail. I was carrying some, my brothers were carrying some. We raised 42 CDs, 40 CDs, went to Yachi Pram, so paid my deposit, happiest person. Then they gave me prospectors. And the day two prospectors, day student prospectors was simply buy shorts, mm -hmm. a blue shirt, sandals, and you are in. And even that, it was a huge struggle. Uh, for me to then get it, come back to Jachi and be enrolled at Jachi Primary Senior High School. So I always say I grew up in an environment that was challenging physically, then went to America by the grace of God, and then I found myself fighting to liberate the low-income uh, neighborhood students from poverty. So I always I fought poverty, overcame poverty, and I, I also went to America to fight on the side of the poor, relatively poor in America to give them the opportunity of education. And that opportunity of education then inured to their benefit at my students got the opportunity to go to top universities in the US. So my philosophy is in place this. We can wage the war against poverty and win. And if we are to do that, we have to have a more robust education system. An education system that does not only guarantee access, but enhances quality. But the education system might also be relevant to the needs of our nation. So I don't look at education from the standpoint of individual benefit, tremendous benefit to individuals. But I look at societal benefits. I look at countries that have changed their fortunes, South Korea, uh, Singapore, uh, the South European nations, uh, where through education, their fortunes have changed. They've transformed them. So my philosophy is nations can improve their fortunes through education. And that education must be relevant to the needs of the country. So that's why I'm passionate about what I do because... The Jachi Pramso that you went to, mm. I visited Jachi Pramso mm. many years ago I see. as a leader of the Scripture Union. We went there to evangelize. Yes. And we saw the dormitories, the mm. building itself, mm. Mm doesn't attract. Mm. But that is where you went. Yes. And that Jachi Pramso mm. made you who you are. Yes. Can we say the same mm. of today's education system, despite what improvement we say we have made to it? You see, the, there's this uh, thinking that whatever we thought we knew is what exists now. So invariably, like your description of Jachi Pramso, Jachi Pramso has changed now. But if you were to speak to Jachi Pramso, you are speaking to Jachi Pramso from your experience, what you saw there. And you may describe it for what it used to be, but not what it is now. So invariably, you hear people talking about, oh, the standards have fallen, things are so bad. It's their projection as to what they think should be happening. And, and because around the world, if you look at education systems, what happens invariably is that countries that increase enrollment rapidly diminish learning outcomes. So even education experts in Ghana, I've heard some of them say standards have fallen because enrollment has gone up. You see, that is what is supposed to be, but that is not what is happening. So if you're a researcher in education, you then have to go and look at the data because that is what education researchers know, that if you increase enrollment, outcomes will diminish. So, you have to then begin to look at what I called Ghanaian magic. 
hmm. where we increase enrollment and the achievement did not fall. We defied gravity, literally, because it's not known around the world. In the secondary education space, you increase enrollment in Ghana. In 2016, it was 830,000 students. Now you've gone to close to 1.4 million. How is it that the students are doing well? Everyone will tell That's you that. That's almost double. It doesn't, yes, almost double. So they will say it doesn't happen anywhere in the world. But what does Ghana do right? You see, when you increase enrollment and you have fixed facilities, it means if you double enrollment, you have to uh, double class sizes. So the classrooms are congested, congested, and in most countries, they don't have excess teachers to deploy. So with limited teachers, limited facilities, you double enrollment, you diminish outcomes because you are going to increase class sizes. Teachers will be overloaded. Ghana has a unique situation. We are the only country, probably one of the few countries in the world where we have excess teachers that can be deployed. In other jurisdictions, even if they want to deploy, they don't have them. Mm. But in addition to that, the interesting thing about the Ghanaian expansion and why we have improved learning outcomes is that when we improve the learning outcomes, we created a different ecosystem. The first is that when we increase enrollment, we made the education free. What it means is that Whereas in, before free secondary education, students would take two weeks, four weeks to come to school because they were waiting at home to look for money to pay their fees. You made it free. Therefore, during the first week, they are there. So because they come during the first week, they are not missing anything. Consequently, the time on task has improved tremendously in our schools. You, you are diving deep already. We'll mm -hmm. get there. Mm -hmm. So... The comments people make mm. generally mm -hmm. about standards have fallen. And for as long as I became aware politically, I've heard this phrase repeated over and again. Sounds as if we're a basket case as far as our mission and uh, a vision for education system is concerned. And yet we, we manage to produce some of the best. Stellar guys who go out and even here, do very well. From your experience, is that not true to some extent? You, for example, for 10 years, have decided that on your own, in your constituency, mm. you are going to recruit at least 100 engineers in your constituency. You started doing that. Yes. How easy is it to get the class of candidates mm. that you sponsor to the universities? Yes. That should tell you that the standards confirm this cliché. You see, the, the, the interesting thing about standards, you have to look at teacher quality. In a country where you now require a bachelor's degree to teach even in KG, standards have not fallen. If you were struggling to get qualified teachers to teach in your schools, then you can say standards have fallen. Teachers are now better prepared, better qualified for our schools. They are being trained uh, differently. You also have are ensured that you enhance the, num the increase the number of students going to high quality schools in the country. You see, when you talk about the, uh, the Bosonchi experience, I, I decided I would sponsor 100 engineers within 10 years. Within two years, I had them. Now I've gone to 150, and I have about 30 of them on my waiting list, waiting to be added. From village to village, when my people visited, they found students who have gone to top high schools in their country. People have gone to Prem Per Presec from Bosonche, and they were waiting for opportunity to go to the university. So it was so easy to find qualified mm. high school graduates to take them to UMAT and take them to KMUST within a period of two to three years. So if standards had fallen, it was not going to be easy for you to find students who have done science and have graduated and they have made, uh, they, have, they are qualified to go into universities. So I have about 30 students doing medicine from Boston Train and I easily found them. Mm -hmm. on, Friday, um, uh, on Wednesday, something profound happened. I met this young man who came to me and said, Minister, I want to thank you for what you did for me. And, and that was before I even started doing the, um, the 150 agenda. These students I picked up, the mom was um, the cleaner of the public toilet mm. and uh, has stayed at home for two years. Um, 
couldn't find the money to buy university and transform. We did it for him. He met me and said, Minister, on Monday, this upcoming Monday, I'm starting uh, my housemanship as a medical doctor at Union Teaching Hospital. You helped me six years ago. You took care of me. You paid my school fees at UDS, and I've graduated, and I want to thank you. These are individuals who opportunity have been extended to. Now you look at the majority of our youth, and they have opportunity for secondary education. And when they go there, it's not the high school of yesteryears. You have students going to STEM schools. You have students who have now an opportunity to do hands-on activities, build robots, even fly drones. So how can you say standards have fallen? We'll talk about <laughs> students in STEM schools and that particular idea and how you intend to use that to revolutionize the education system in line with your vision of the kind of schools that mm. you are known to have built. Mm -hmm. Whether that really works here mm. and you mm. can achieve that. Mm. But let's look at the evidence in our face right now mm -hmm. from the WASI results just, that just came, 2023. Mm. From where you sit, mm. what does the result communicate to you? The result tells me that the work of the headmasters and the students and the teachers is truly showing outcomes. You have teachers who have sacrificed their lives so much so that they stay after school, they are there before school, and they support these students to work hard so that we can see the outcomes that we are seeing. Uh, this cannot be by accident. If you had a situation where it went up and down, and then one year it fell and then you go down, then you can say that it's by accident. This is not by accident. You see, we've opened the floodgates of quality presec at Chimota education to the, a huge number of students. Our uh, presec used to bring in 1,000 uh, students there about. Now you have 1,500, and some years 1,800. The 500 extra, the 800 extra, is getting quality presec education. Before free senior high school, the A1 to C6, which is the pass rate, um, was about 95%. Now Presec is doing 98% with increase in the number of students who are getting the quality Presec experience. So if you look at the numbers that have been able to go to these top tier schools, outcomes should be better. And then those who are going to uh, schools that does not have the same pedigree as our top schools, they also are going to schools where they have more opportunities uh, in terms of the resources and the laboratories that we are doing there. So if you look at what has happened in integrated science, 28.7% uh, passed in 2015. When we say pass, we mean the pass that can take you to university, A1 to C6, 28.7. Now it's 66.82, and this cannot be by accident. It has been increasing over the years. You look at the 2022 results. You look at English uh, language uh, from 60.39 uh, to 73. Uh, you look at mat uh, mathematics, uh, you look at all our integrated science, in every field there was an increase, in every subject there was an increase. So this cannot be an accident. Things are changing, our headmasters are doing a better job, parents are doing a better job supporting their students, and the government has made a huge commitment, and this investment, I believe based on the numbers that we see, is paying us. So it cannot be said mm. that standards are falling, you go to the basic schools, and you see what is happening there in terms of intervention. Now we are saying to our schools, junior high school, if students come to you and they can't read, it's your responsibility to get them reading before they leave there. So we started what is called intervention programs. At the senior high school, we began intervention program. Students come to form one and they can't read. You should not just give them 10 subjects. You're going to give them eight subjects. The two additional ones are going to be intervention English class, intervention mathematics class to boost their proficiency in mathematics and boost their proficiency in English during the regular school day. And then after school, there should be intervention for them. This is something that uh, uh, Wesley guests have been doing for a long time. They assess students who, came to, uh, who come to them, and after the assessment, they prescribe intervention for them. So it's not a sink or swim. You are in form one, and therefore, you are just like everybody else. You are in the English class just like everybody else. So we see that this is the best since the SHS started. Um, the best since the SHS started. Mm -hmm. And also the best since 2015. 
the best since 2015. 2015. Because you see, before 2015, we had the Kufu graduates who came through um, um, the, His Excellency late at Amels. Those were the ones who were doing four years. Mm. So the four-year result is now quietly being matched by this three-year results in 20. So it's, it's two levels. Since 2015, this is the best. Almost a decade, this is the best. And then since we started the Free Senior High School, this is the best. So there has been a gradual uh, build-up in terms of proficiency, in terms of learning outcomes in our senior high schools. Mm. So between 2016 and 2022, mm -hmm. We see about 10% increase mm -hmm. in the WASI pass rates mm -hmm. for all four core mm -hmm. subjects. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding, the gross tertiary enrollment target, 25% mm -hmm. by 2021, mm -hmm. was missed 19%. Mm -hmm. With a 2030 target of 40%, 40%. in line to be missed, mm since we are lagging mm -hmm. at 20 percent today due to the slow growth mm -hmm. of the tertiary admissions mm -hmm. why is the core wasi results not reflecting at the tertiary level you see what we have to realize as a nation is the the importance of gross tertiary enrollment ratio i think the sense of agency is now coming mm. uh, it didn't used to be a sense of agency for anyone you know uh, during the Rollins era when we were in at the university, the Britain Woods institutions, World Bank, IMF, they told the government that university education is a private good. It's for individual benefit. <laughs> Subsidies were removed. There were looters, uh, demonstrations everywhere. I remember when our university was shut down mm. about four times mm. uh, when I was there because the government said subsidy dispensed with it. Uh, instructed by the IMF, instructed by the World Bank. A number of countries were instructed to do the same they did, but countries like Brazil did not. They didn't. And they were, they stuck to their guns and said, no, tertiary education is important. So the country that did not heed to the advice of the Bretton Woods institutions and invested in tertiary, then begin, began uh, to see the transformation. If you look at what has happened in, in China, for example, the numbers that were there in 2005 and where they are now getting close to 60% gross tertiary enrollment ratio. It was this idea that we needed to do this and they focus on it. Now a sense of agency has been created for us. The sense of agency is that we need to boost our gross tertiary enrollment ratio. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 1970s, it was about 0.9%. So if you really look at where we have been or where we are now, if you are looking at that, you can say there has been growth. But now you have to look at the sense of agency that has been created for us, especially by the 1972. We had a 0.9% gross tertiary enrollment ratio. Um, 1971, India had 12.69. Mm. Now India is at 31.3%. Uh, China in 2005 was 19.3%. Now China is about 60%. And of course, South Korea is over 100 102.47%. So it's the sense of agency that has now uh, um, been brought to bear. The president has said 30%, uh, uh, we need to get 40% by 2030. Uh, we are working with GTEC, we are looking at an action plan that will help boost the numbers in the private sector. Um, the idea of having um, this student loan where you, need, you don't need guarantor, the no guarantor policy world resource will open the floodgates of education to a number of students who cannot go now mm. because of funding. If I had not made that, uh, given the opportunity to some few students, there's no way 150 of them could be doing engineering and medicine and all those courses. So I think the opportunity is through a well resource, well funded student loan uh, program so that the barrier to tertiary once the academic achievement is enhancing, the financial barrier will forever be removed. Mm. So the students will have an opportunity. We also are aligning when the loans come out and when students go to school. So uh, the, if you look at what has happened over the years, even with Coco Marketing Boss Scholarship, mm -hmm. the poor who needed it the most to go were not getting it before they entered. Yeah. You have to go to the school to apply. So now, 
if you, the, the student loan trust fund is going to open the portal and they should, they should be opening it this week. So, so there are, they are, they are deliberate plans to ensure mm -hmm. that these pass rates mm -hmm. will reflect in the at the tertiary level uh, access. So you remove the cost barrier. Mm. So removing the cost barrier means that the student loan trust fund resource should be made available at the gate, not after. If we are waiting for them to enter, majority of them cannot enter. So the whole thing is that open the portal at the time that admissions are coming out into tertiary so that those who don't have the money can then borrow to go and stop the practice of come first and after one year, six months, you apply. Mm. So once you do that, we can boost our tertiary enrollment numbers because they're going to get the support at the gate. So you're not going to have a situation where people don't apply at all. So, right. So while we celebrate these numbers, mm -hmm. there's a question to be asked. Mm. Since 2021, mm. uh, we have not been writing WASI with Anglophone West Africa. That tells me, uh -huh. since we're doing our own local WASI, uh -huh. that this is not standardized. So we cannot be making comparisons, correct? It's not local WASI. We are not doing local WASI. Mm. The exams are set by West African countries, examiners from all the countries. We are not doing local WASI. Okay. You see, this is what is happening. The WASI questions, it's not like our time. All right. During our time, we're writing the same questions for Nigeria and Sierra Leone and all this. Sometimes we'll say, oh, the, this year the questions were set by Nigeria and the English was so difficult. It's no longer the case. If you go to WAIC, they will tell you that they've done serialization, different questions for different countries, even if you were writing it at the same time. So the Ghana exam that we are writing is set by the entire West Africa. The okay. examiners mm -hmm. are West Africa. The reason why Ghana, uh, by, we are now moving towards coming back the pre COVID, we had to make a decision. The decision was that if you want to um, test with all, the whole West Africa, then you're going to give your student five months to prepare for the exam. All right. So we have a choice. Okay. Give them five months, and if they use five months to prepare for WASI, they won't do well. Because you need about eight months to prepare for WASI. But if you want to force yourself and test with the entire West Africa, then you're going to tell the student that you have five months to prepare mm. for the WASI. Right. So you have a decision to make. Right. And, and you see, WASI is not a non-reference exam. Non-reference is that when you finish the exams, you put the bell curve, as we know, in education. So some years, you can get 60% and get A1. In some years, you must get 70% and you get A1. Right. That is a non-reference exam. Okay. What so, see is criterion. Mm. It's based on the hard pass. If you don't pass it, you failed. We'll move away from what she shortly. <laughs> but, but tell me... Um, how concerned are you about, about the exam or practice in re relation to WASI? Mm -hmm. And to think that the examiner tells us that mm. the fraud, mm. even trying to copy AI responses, mm -hmm. which are not answers, mm -hmm. were actually seen in some of the papers. Mm -hmm. How concerned are you about that? What, what, what do you think ought to be done? Or what, what, would, what are you doing? in that direction? You see, um, two years ago, the president in his State of the Nation address directed me to find a solution to the perennial examination of practice at the BEC and then at the WASI level. And I went to work, had a meeting with WAIC. The instruction to them, direction to them was very simple, that we need to do randomization of questions, or what is called serialization. You see, around the world, they had to find a solution. If you sit there and say that somehow I'll talk to the students and they will stop, I'll talk to the parents and they will stop, I'm getting ambassadors to preach, it's not going to be. Until we go e-testing, electronic testing, where if I'm sitting next to you, your questions are going to be different from mine because the computer selects automatically right. for each one of us. So I can cheat. Mm. Your essay will be different from mine. Then you have to do it manually. So we began with BEC. Three years ago, every region had different questions. That was when 
the Instagram signs that were selling the questions shut down completely. Because they realized that the questions that came, people who bought them, they bought Ashanti region question, they were in the voter region. Mm -hmm. So Instagram pages shut down Brilliant. completely. Mm. And they stopped on the BEC. The following year, the last two years, WIAC has set questions, different questions at the same level of difficulty, sometimes the same question, but your question, why is my question 10? They've done that randomization for all examination centers across the country on the BEC level. So if anybody tells you that during the last year there have been leakages, no, there has not been leakages. However, within the examination center, since they are having the same set of questions, you can have more practices going on. The next step that we are going, which we are working with why to go, is to randomize within the classroom, within the exam center. So my questions, your questions will be different. So that's, going to be, that's going to be expensive. Oh, yes, but it has to be done. It has to be done. There's no reason that we can have a solution with sitting and say, no, they say they need new equipment. Since, since, we, we, since we advertise that you are coming on the show this mm -hmm. morning, mm -hmm. there are teachers in the university mm -hmm. who share concerns. Mm -hmm. they, they say, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. good WASI results, mm -hmm. the best mm -hmm. whatever, but the products that mm -hmm. come to us at the university, mm -hmm. it's, it's not the best. Let me tell you one thing. Everywhere in the world, it's what you put in place at your level of education. I'm educators, teachers, I'm a teacher at the core. And what we do is the blame game. How do we do it? Universities will say the high school students are not good. High school will say the junior high school students are not good. Junior high school will say, oh, the primary school teacher did a terrible job. Primary school teachers will blame the KG teachers, and the poor KG teacher with nobody to blame, blame the parents, that the parents are not preparing the children well. In the, around the world, when you get students at the university, uh, there was a famous statement by one professor who said, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. They are not good, so they're not going to graduate from us better. And I'm saying universities should see themselves as recycling plants. When you have students coming to you and you believe that, oh, the standards, that is where you have English writing courses for them. You see, the reason is very simple. We can't at the high school blame junior high school. No, you do the intervention there so the, uh, the students will be better. When they come to the university and you realize the university as a whole, not the professor, individual professor cannot set his own policies. All right. At the university level, met with VCG, our directive and advice and encouragement to them is that if two students are doing land economy, if you do a placement exam, which is very different from entry exams, placement exam is to help you place the student. If the student comes and English proficiency is lacking, what we do around the world is that they do English 99, below university level English class. So the two of us are doing that, but my courses are going to be different the first year because I need English proficiency. I need to master the English language. You see, that is not to say high school shouldn't do a better job. That mm. is not to say junior high shouldn't do a better job. But we should not turn out or turn out graduates who are not meeting the premier University of Ghana standards. But it is serious and concerning mm -hmm. that the teachers mm -hmm. at the junior and high school, mm -hmm. as many as 9,000 mm -hmm. will fail the licensure exams. Mm -hmm. The yes. exams that you're using mm -hmm. To seek to get the best to do the job. So that's good news because we are getting the best. If we're passing everybody on, nobody will fail. What NTC and we've all discussed they should do is to get steady materials. Because it's a new exam. And I think it's, 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 so, it's not fair to the person coming to write the exam that he can't pick up a book and read and prepare. Because obviously, the, the content of the, uh, the exam should be exposed to them. So this upcoming is, I've told them, you need, we need to make sure, so I've teamed them up with NACA to prepare steady materials for them. I think they can do it, but the exams are very different from the courses that they are used to. Mm. The exams are assessing more critical thinking. And maybe the grades from their teachers, the courses that they did, it's not aligned. So we need to do a better job helping them prepare. I have no doubt in my mind that majority of them are going to do well when we prepare and give them the material that they need. And also 
colleges of education. And it's not just the colleges of education. Majority of the teachers are coming from distance programs from the universities. So invariably, people talk about, oh, the training colleges, the old training colleges. No, majority of the students are not coming from the training colleges. They are coming from distance education programs offered through uh, UCC, Winneba, and they are everywhere in the country. So you are saying that the fact that over 9,000 have failed this exam mm -hmm. is actually a positive and a justification for keeping the licensure exams instead of scrapping it. Yes, because you have to help them to meet the standards, to enter the classroom and do a great job for our children. If you are realizing that unfortunately they are not meeting the standards, why pass them on? You help them do a better job. Now we are doing restructuring, re-engagement with NTC to ensure that as soon as they finish school, they can write the exams there. So they don't go out and stay at home and be stale mm. for one year waiting to write their exam. So if you do those movements and you provide teaching and learning materials that aligns with the exam content, they are going to do a better job. And I think the country is better for it, that we are helping them to pass the exams, to meet the requirement, the rigorous requirement to enter the classroom. But if you take the easy road, we don't nobody like exams. Nobody like exams. And therefore, if you take the easy road as a politician and say, I'm going to scrap it, they will jubilate. Mm. But are the students in the classroom going to jubilate? Interesting. If you're just joining us, uh, this is News File. It's your final edition for 2023. And we begin the first hour with an interaction with the Education Minister and MP for Bosom Tree, Dr. Yao Osei Educhum. And we're talking about the WASI results that is being celebrated and asking and trying to test if it reflects, you know, the quality of the products that are being churned out for the universities and subsequently uh, to our job market. Now, but, but, but you, you see the interesting thing mm. is that these students get to, from Ketasco and all these places, get to Harvard mm. and top the class. So th there's something to be said about quality. Students are going around the world in UK, they send me their exams results, mm -hmm. doing fantastic job. So if you have one evidence of a student not doing well, sometimes, you see, we generalize it over all the students. But the professors will tell you that they also have students sitting in their classes mm -hmm. and they are doing a fantastic job. But the one that may not be performing, maybe the one that is single, that, but we should also celebrate those who are doing a great job in Ghana and outside Ghana, students who are sitting in classrooms and they have great ideas and their number of professors who attest to the fact that this student coming from Drobonso, from a village in Bosonchen, they are now at the university and they are doing a great job. So invariably, I understand mm. that we'll talk more about the challenged mm. one right. and may not say anything about those who come to class mm. and challenge us as professors in our, in our letter halls. Right. And, and I'm already getting some of the messages from our viewers. And, and this one says that the problem is from the teachers. They charge the children to supply them with answers during the exams. I have received many reports <clears throat> from displeased teachers concerning the practices of their colleagues. The problem is also pervasive across education, educational levels that even nurses uh, training colleges are doing it too for final line strokes, licensure exams. We need a national mentality reset. There are those who raise the question about even teaching pupils and limiting them to extra classes. So if you can't afford, you don't get to be taught certain things. And then you go higher up and people are doing, uh, is it pamphlets, handouts. If you can't afford, you won't get it. I, I think it used to be the case that if you could not afford, you could not do extra classes. That is not the case now. And this is some, some of the things that I say. That's not the case anymore? No, because we disbursed 65 million, and we're about to disburse one in the next few uh, days to our senior high schools for extra classes. The government picked up. The government is paying for the extra, extra classes, classes so that it will be uniform. Yes. 
So that it wouldn't be said that because you couldn't afford, you were in class, and the next day the teacher would take something different, advancing on what was done after school. So it's not the case now. But somehow people think it's the norm. It's no longer the norm in our senior high schools, and headmasters will attest. Well, why don't you simply increase the you know, uh, contact hours and pay for that instead of pay no, for no, extra you classes? See, you see, we've increased contact hours. Correct. Yeah, we've increased contact hours. But also know that until you do intervention within the school day. You see, I, I visited Frafraha Senior High School, and the headmistress was talking to me about uh, the fact that the intervention that they're doing after school because it's a day school, a number of students could not stay. So my whole thing was that, why don't you do it during the regular day? And mm. to do it the regular day means you may have to take away some subjects. So the, um, something like unexaminable ICT course. During the first year, for a student who is struggling in English and mathematics, they don't do the unexaminable, but they do the extra intervention coursework uh, in English, and they do it in mathematics. So during the regular school day, you then introduce the intervention to make sure they have a better opportunity to improve themselves. But in the meantime, before we get there and make it universal, after school is a rare opportunity where you can get more interaction uh, with the teacher and get support. And now the government is paying for it. Mm. So, so that you don't have a situation where students who can't afford do not get extra support. But you see, when it comes to examination malpractices, this is the first time we are confronting it head on. Mm. This is the first time we are saying, right? So, thank you, Alice. You, you've spoken about that. And uh, as you see in the background, it brings me to the question of the science, technology, and engineering mathematics uh, STEM. Mm -hmm. I've heard some teachers who say, this is what you need. But I've heard some say, we, we, don't get, we don't get it. Something is happening in this country. Uh, these days I say I do evidence-based communication because I know they don't trust politicians. We are used to saying plans are far advanced, it's in the pipeline, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't come out of the pipeline. That's right. So the president is determined that basic schools, uh, junior high schools, primary schools have to be revamped. The infrastructure should really fit 21st century. So if you look at what is happening now, we have new junior high schools under construction, and I think the pitch, some of the pictures were coming up mm. because the environment should be conducive to 21st century teaching and learning. So if you see some of the images that we're showing, I wish it will come, mm. you're going to see that the junior high school landscape is changing. You see, we have 11,000 junior high schools, and if you want to change each one of them, it's literally impossible. But in mid-sized towns like Jaben, or Nui, and other places, Chamba in the northern region, what you can truly do is that you bring about four, five junior high schools together in one place, in one building. That has biology, chemistry, physics lab, computer lab, everything is there. Move junior high schools from 19th century to 21st century. Put them in an environment where they can do STEM. And once that happens, you have changed the future of those students. I think a number of... What, what's new about this? The new about it is that junior high school biology, chemistry, and physics lab, STEM lab computer lab, never seen it before. The environment is different. We've even changed their uniforms uh, so that they feel different about themselves. So the era where we define public schools as rectangular shaped building, painted brown and yellow, where the students wear brown and yellow uniforms should be a thing of the past, and the revolution has begun. And you see some schools in Accra here, I think they were showing some images of it, mm. the Accra STEM Academy, a school that begins from kindergarten all the way to high school, it's a community school. And you go and see the infrastructure and the equipment that is in it. But we are not limiting ourselves to Accra, not limiting ourselves to Kumase and urban areas. Mid-South stands are seeing a revolution. I'll, I'll tell you the story of Jabin in the Ashanti region. The building that has been put up there, the junior high school, is going to bring all, they have seven junior high schools, and we are, they are moving all the seven junior high students to one building. See, they, they are coming from buildings that have been there for uh, many, many years, 70 years, no electricity, dilapidated, into a new building space that has all the science labs that they need. And that is a different environment. Moving schools from 19th century to 21st century, they're mm -hmm. going to get everything that they need to have to do STEM and to do other activities. 
so that they become well-rounded individuals. By the time they get to high school, they will have truly equipped themselves to do a better job. So this is the so, Accra STEM Academy. And this is, this is dependent, driven heavily mm -hmm. by infrastructure. Infrastructure. Which is an area you are said not to be doing well at all. We're doing very well, but you guys don't know. Evidence-based communication. Look at this school. When this school is done, finished, this is just like any school anywhere in any developed country. You see, the idea that we are not doing well, I, I take the responsibility mm -hmm. that we need to do better at communication. We have done all these things. And for the president not to get credit for it and to be told that you are not doing anything in terms of infrastructure, the number of buildings that have been put up in existing schools, and then we move from here and say, you know what, not just existing schools, new schools, new STEM schools across the length and breadth of this country. You go to Abomosu and you see what is going on. You go to Accra, East Legon, and you see this building moving so fast. By March, it will be done. You're going to see students in an environment that nobody ever thought public school would be in. Because, you see, I don't understand why. And I always use the example of a, uh, a man called uh, Bishop in Kumasi. He has a school in that great Enzimai area. New mission. Beautiful school. And I'm saying to myself, how is it that a private man can take his money and borrow and do such a beautiful school. And the government, with all our resources, have always looked at uh, a rectangular shape building, painted brown and yellow, as our public schools. That should be a turn of the path. You look at this school, it was built under the leadership of Nana Danko Kufan. Mm. And there are 10 of them across the country, Abomo, Super, Sempe, all over the country, we have them. And these are new schools that have been built. Each one of these schools have 12 science labs. Every day, the teacher can do science lab activities. And by the way, we you, to you initiated 1,105. Mm -hmm. And you were expecting, I mean, this was, uh, had been initiated in 2017. And as we speak, 2023, we understand you have only 200, uh, 524 of these projects complete. You see, we have... That's um, a long way to go. Actually, it should be more than that, but mm -hmm. I can't look at, debate the numbers here. Okay. But you see, President Nanadu Danko Kufuado, his philosophy for education, intervention, and expansion of facilities is, is, captures that of President Kufu and President Mahama and Mills. President Kufu did the model of schools, upgraded existing schools, or doggone, and a number of schools across the country got huge infusion of infrastructure, and the schools were transformed. Kumasi Anglican in Kumasi and a number of them. So he did a model of schools, transforming existing schools. President Mills and Mahama then uh, did the new schools, the e-blocks, which is new. Nana Lanko Kufuado's approach is this. Existing schools new infrastructure expansion. So you go to Pokwari, Prempe, KSTS, a number uh, at, at Tamasco, mm -hmm. new facilities have been built in the existing schools. But he also decided to build new schools. And that is where you see all these new schools also under construction. So he co he's combining enhancing facilities in existing schools and building new schools. So literally doing what President Mahama and Mel's did and President Kufo did and doing both at the same time. So in terms of, so you look at this facility and this is your um, new junior high school. Right. Uh, this is going to replace the old rectangular shape of, uh, building painted brown and yellow. And you're going to go here. And it's not just an architectural rendering because a number of these are under construction. But you are augmenting the e-blocks. Of course. We are, we've opened more e-blocks than under the NDC government. They have started it. And I'm, for, I'm on record to say that e-block is a great edifice, great opportunity for teaching and learning. The location is what becomes a challenge mm. for you as you begin to operationalize. So you look at, at Domi Kwabinya, you look at uh, uh, Frafraha, these were in urban areas. By the time they finished, packed with students, everywhere that e-block has been built an urban area, students are in, and we've even added more buildings at the location. However, if an e-block is built in a remote location, in a village somewhere, where you have to walk five miles from the village to get to, then unless you provide dormitory blocks, you can't operationalize it. So if you look at what we've done at um, uh, Nsaura, mm -hmm. we've added dormitory blocks. You go to Adansia Peja, there was a huge 
noise made about it when are you opening then we went there and built dormitories so now adansia peja is no longer a community day school because the, the town has one junior high school so if you build a school that has capacity for 1200 and it's a day school only the resident from the town can go but the moment you add a dormitory block then the area students can then come there and then the building become more useful so, so the e-blocks, as we understand, mm -hmm. there were 22 of them that had been completed when by can, yeah. 2016. Mm -hmm. And you have ensured the completion of 15 additional Even more e blocks now, because okay. now we've opened more. Okay. Uh, so, so the whole idea is that open by other dormitory, if it's not in the city. All right. Uh, if it's in the city, open without dormitory, you'll be fine. Mm. So all those in remote locations, we are adding dormitory blocks. All right. Um, once you add a dormitory block, then the building becomes more useful to the taxpayer. And that is what our approach has been, that if it's in a remote location, unless you add dormitory blocks, uh, we, we've attempted opening of some schools where only one student will show up because they cannot be day students at those locations. And therefore, the, the whole e-block thing, good idea in terms of infrastructure, wrong policy in terms of location, hmm. and you have to write that wrong to make the buildings useful right. to the Ghanaians. Ghanian. If you are just joining us, uh, we are having an interaction with the Education Minister, Dr. Yao Ose Edichum, on the back of the WASI results that's been touted. Of course, that's the fact that they are the best uh, so far that the country has um, uh, chalked, but there have also been concerns that have been raised and he's seeking to address them. Um, like I said, um, your comments, send them in and we will share them uh, with him. Uh, Eugene Oseitutu is asking, is it a question? He says, Dr. Oseitum has remained one of the few bright spots within this regime. Many challenges still remain, but when you scan around, he stands out as one of the few working ministers. Hakim uh, Nuruddin, is it, says, please ask the minister how far have they gone with the printing of textbooks for JHS uh, students, especially English textbooks? I'm a JHS English teacher in the Upper West region, and I can confirm to you there are no textbooks at all. It's a big struggle for us. And that brings me right to my perhaps next mm. and final leg mm. of uh, this uh, discussion, in including questions of curriculum. Mm. Curriculum, a uh, big, big thing uh, in terms of changing what students uh, we teach students and what they learn, making it more hands-on, critical thinking, bringing STEM. Uh, you can't memorize STEM. <laughs> you can't memorize the construction of robotics. You can't ask a student to describe how do you build a robot. Right. They have to build a robot. So if you look at what has been happening in that space, uh, if you look at a school like a Fia Kubi Ampem, uh, where they started a uh, teacher starting aviation and aerospace club, and now we are taking that, we are making a full-scale career pathway uh, for students. You go to a place like Accra High, there's a STEM center there. Mm -hmm. And now students get to do engineering sciences at Accra High School, which is embedded with robotics and coding. And, and it's fascinating when you go and look at what they are doing with their heads and with their hands. So the and are you delivering on the one uh, student per laptop? It's coming. Because you need that to go hand it's, in hand with this kind of introduction. It's coming very soon. Mm. So far, I have 450,000 of them. And we, beginning January, deployment is going to uh, happen across the length and breadth of this country. And with connectivity at the various schools, we are changing the space of uh, education at the secondary level. It's a transformation that people are going to see. Because, you see, if you look at what this young man is doing on our screens, this is a young man who gets to visit across them, Accra High School, and these young ones go there and they do coding, they do robotics. Uh, in fact, the kind of uh, equipment and tools that they've been exposed to is hard to find, even in developed nations, and it's here in Ghana. So, so the curriculum is driven by the equipment and the tools that you make. So what we are seeing here is a public facility. Public facility, Accra High School, and the students are there, and it's be if you go there, and, and my friends see pictures of them and say, is this Ghana? Say, it looks like a private Montessori sort of. 
<laughs> public school standards are going right. through transformation. All right. So what we are looking at is this. Uh, whether it is about increasing our engineering numbers in the country, now we have pre-engineering programs. You can go to UMAT, go to Pentecost University, and if you did not do science, they'll give you one year intensive science coursework. After that, you can become an engineering student. Mm. So things are changing in the space of curriculum, what the students are learning from uh, pre-tertiary all the way to tertiary. Now, in terms of textbook, Correct. I don't give promises, but my colleague teacher who called in from the north about junior high school textbooks, within a month, is going to see books in his school. Within a month? Within a month. I don't promise this, but I know what I'm It's been a major issue. You've yes, been aware yes, of yes. this. Yes, and it's going. The junior high school textbook will hit the classrooms. And when it starts, since I've made the pledge on your show, I'll show you the pictures of the delivery. Mm. And if I have a, I'll get a contact person of the teacher, I would love to have communication with him um, uh, after this for him to be assured that we are fully aware and we are going to make sure they get the tools that they need in order to do well. But you see, the transformation that you are seeing, whether it's at KG level, these are KG classrooms in Ghana. It didn't used to be this way. The uh, question is how sustainable mm. this is. It's been the biggest issue that has plagued our development, mm -hmm. including in the education sector. There's one thing I can tell you. Government can do what government wants to do. Government. If they want to do something, they can do it. When the model junior high schools that you are seeing, funded mainly by the Arab Development Bank, mm -hmm. Malia. when I became the minister, they had funding to build same buildings, small rectangular shaped buildings. I made a case to them that if you help me put one of these buildings in a mid-sized town, I will be able to bring all students there, I will provide them quality education, I will move the schools in the community from 19th century to 21st century. They said, go ahead and do it. So if I didn't have that philosophy and that passion, and I was not given the opportunity by the president, all this model school that you are seeing couldn't have been built. So that's why I'm saying sustainability depends upon the de determination of a government, a mission-driven minister for education, supported by the president, provided resources by the minister for finance, you will see transformation. Sustainability is the government determination and fear determination that education has to be transformed. And when that is there, transformation will happen. There's a question as to whether the Garanta system, the new one that you have introduced, is actually working. Uh, because there were that out of 20,000 applicants, mm. only 20,000 received funding. 20, and that is a challenge. 20,000 applicants. Uh, yes, 30,000 applicants, only 20,000 received funding. 30,020 received funding. Yes. Not bad for a percentage, but I know the other 10,000 also need support. Okay. Uh, so I will leave with uh, Nana J. Eboa, a fantastic guy doing some great job at the Student Loan Trust Fund and see what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the guarantor policy that we had put in place was disadvantaging those coming from less means. My mom didn't work for government. He definitely doesn't have social security contribution. My dad didn't do. So if I was to look at that circle, media circle, family circle, to access student loans, I can do it. So a number of students did not even apply because they could not get access to because they need a guarantor who has social security contributions, net contribution to be used. Mm, right. So this system is better, but of course we have to find more resources to make sure, and, and I'm concerned about the 10,000 who didn't get it. All right. Yeah, so I'll, I'll liaise with him uh, to see the best way forward to make sure everybody who applies get that wonderful opportunity. I think you've seen images of yes, yes, uh, yes, some yes, Boston yes. STEM Academy, one of the, I would say the first girls STEM high school, All right. um, probably in West Africa. Uh, dedicated, a school dedicated towards STEM like none other. And um, this is a school that we have affiliated purposefully uh, with uh, Wesley Girls. Mm. So Ms. Jokoto, a distinguished former headmistress of Wesley Girls, is in charge of the school, mentoring the headmaster, headmistress, mentoring the teachers, mentoring the students, and the outcomes are beginning to show. So you see, what we have done in this country is that we start a new school, we leave it mm. to sink or swim. And invariably, the new school struggle. That is why we only have 54 high-performing schools. What happens to the about 900? 
We have to begin a process where we know the best practice of Wesley Girls. We take those pr best practices and infuse it into the new schools. So Abomosu STEM School, for example, is affiliated with Presec. We've taken our assistant headmaster from Presec, we've put him there so that the best practice of Presec can be infused into the school. I have no doubt in my mind that within the next uh, five years, you're going to get some high-performing, high-demand schools to reduce the pressure on the existing high-performing schools. So, for example, this year, the demand for Boson STEM, unbelievable. Mm. The, 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 the category A schools, they were competing with them. They filled up faster than most of the category A schools because it's in high demand. So the bottom line is that you cannot just build a new school and leave it to just be there. Right. You know the best practices, and those best practices should be practiced at that new school so that parents will begin to demand the pressure on the so-called Ivy League schools right. is so high, and we have to... Be before, you, before you take leave of us, there are some parents who are not excited about mm. what you have put them through mm. in, in the last month. Oh, the parents, I'm so sorry if they've gone through some terrible time, but we've improved this year than any other year. You see, the past few years, you only have 69% who will get schools of their choice. This year, we did 80.9% who got the schools of their choice. And then the 19%, the interesting thing is that we run the whole placement system again. We asked schools to give us extra spaces, and then we did automatic placement again. For the first time in the history of school placement, we have 99.5% of students getting their schools. Never happened before. I sat with the staff, and I said, artificial intelligence is here. There's no reason why we can't do a better job. I commend the, uh, the leader of the team, uh, Mr. Dakwa, mm. the Frisnia High School coordinator, and his able team. They came together. Uh, together with the IT uh, experts, they were able to secure spaces for 99.6% and still counting. My goal is to make sure that 100%. And you know, this year, <laughs> it has been interesting. We had the largest uh, takers of the exam, uh, the BEC, uh, this year was over 600,000, never happened before. And so far, 585,000 has been placed in their schools of choice. The speaker suggested to you, as it were, represented parents' concern to mm. you that mm. you didn't have to let them go to school for just, mm. Uh, mm. is it two weeks or less? Uh, two and a half weeks, yes. there about. You see, when school starts, you go, you do your orientation, you do all the sort of things they want the students to do, and then instruction begins. We had to do something. The thing we needed to do is to bring our high schools to the pre-COVID era in terms of our instructional calendar. Mm. And what had happened over the years is that we are moving gradually towards that place. Last year, or this academic year, it began in February. The next academic year is now beginning in December. Mm. So it tells you the next academic year will now be shipped into September and everything will be great. Not opening school meant we're going to open in January and then we'll be one year behind our calendar. You see, and what people didn't also know that before school begins, you procure your perishable items. If students had not gone, all those who have gone to waste. So those of us in the inside saw that changing the date was not feasible. All right. We will make a, another date because I think, there, I think we need there are so a, much a number it. of uh, <laughs> issues, challenges, and questions that you will have to respond to. And opportunities mm. for transformation of our education system that I want to showcase to Ghanaians. Thank you so, very much. So we need to come back. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's uh, Dr. Yao Osei Educhum, who is the Education Minister and MP for Bosumchi. We have been interacting with on your final edition of the show for 2023. Uh, I hope uh, you relaxed and were able to enjoy uh, just a bit of this uh, interaction. Thank you very much. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Can leave now? Yes. All right.